excited to be part of this discussion. Many analysts are saying that by 2030, this market is going to be almost $30 billion. And uh, the more optimistic view is that it's going to be around $9 trillion by 2050. As we discuss the potential of this segment, we are not just envisioning flying vehicles, but literally the third dimension of urban mobility. And however, for this new frontier, we also need to keep in mind the right governance and safety, which is going to be essential. <coughs> so with that, let me pose my first question to Dr. Reddy. Dr. Reddy, what do you think are the key drivers and trends that are shaping this industry? Milu, uh, and uh, at the outset, let me uh, uh, extend my greetings to all of you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And also a very uh, warm welcome to uh, uh, Fuzukawa San and his uh, team. To your question, Milu, about um, what are the key drivers for growth, you also mentioned uh, a little while earlier that this is um, about a $30 billion industry by 2028 and potentially could become $10 trillion or $9 trillion in uh, years to come. Uh, and I believe that you know any of those uh, numbers could be true because, you see, this is not a mature market. It is an evolving market at this point of time. And in an evolving situation, evolving markets we have seen a number of parameters that work. And today what we see is a number of things which are working in the positive terrain and as a result of it, I think the growth will get further accelerated. It might be even larger than $30 billion in this period and I'm not too sure about the $9 trillion, I've not looked at that map. So therefore, in an evolving market as opposed to a mature market, what we see is you can't really estimate the growth. It's just a uh, stretch your human imagination to see that uh, things will fall into place. Now, if you look at the key drivers that are happening at this point of time, uh, is, of course, uh, technology. Uh, I keep saying this, that um, I have been with uh, technology for the last 50 years. Uh, some of you may be familiar, may not be familiar. I started writing programs, uh, computer programs, in a language called Autocoder way back in uh, 1971. That's when I started my career. Uh, and I used to write autocoder programs. Then I wrote Fortran programs and so on and so forth. But trust me, I haven't seen technology accelerating at a pace that it's done at this point of time. I'll give you an example where we are today. Uh, I'm sure everybody is talking about AI, they're talking about chat GPTs and so on and so forth. To give you a relevant example to see how the acceleration is happening. Uh, I believe the first intervention of AI uh, into our common um, uh, things that all of us do was on, um, uh, was on handwriting recognition. And this um, handwriting recognition initiative was done all the way back in 1996. That's called the zero baseline. And it took 21 years thereafter to get to a, the human efficiency. That is, you and I can also read anybody's handwriting, right? Most of them, except the doctors, I guess. Doctors' handwriting is very difficult to read, but I guess now the computers can even do that. But on a serious note, we can get to that 100% efficiency of human beings. They took 21 years. No, but after chat GPT came in, if you look at comprehension, you give a five-page note to chat GPT and say, I want to compress this into five paragraphs without losing the theme, without losing this, uh, the content of the whole five pages. It can do it for you in less than five seconds. You might thereafter work about half an hour thereafter to say, you know, my style has to come by, etc. But more important than that is from a 0% efficiency yeah. to 100% efficiency, it took 180 days. So look at the pace at which technology is make, this is to become 100% efficient as a human being. So the one key driver that I believe um, is all about technology. Technology is driving this industry and will continue to drive in years to come because this does not seem to be slowing down in any way. What we are seeing is it will become faster and faster and there will be newer things that will come by. But on the other side, we're also seeing that there's a fairly large demand 
that's there for um, the uh, UAMs at this point of time. Why is it happening is primarily, it, it's a global phenomenon, it's not necessarily Indian phenomenon. Urbanization continues to increase. And urbanization, 33% of global population is in urban cities. One third of it and other two thirds of it somewhere else. So look at the type of challenges we have in a country like India, uh, is that there are 330 million people who live in cities at this point in time. Yeah. This is as good as the population of the United States. So there, and in urban areas, Developing infrastructure is not the easiest thing to do. And the growing middle class has certainly given good ability to go and buy cars. So you can't demolish the whole city to say I make roads, so who, where will you all go and live thereafter? So therefore, I think there are, there, there have to be ways and means by which our mobility has to become efficient. And that's the enormous amount of demand that we are seeing. And there are applications which, at this point of time, cannot be serviced otherwise. You, you, I feel very pained at times that ambulances get stuck in traffic. That guy is honking like crazy, but nobody gives way to him. But more important is, look at the pathetic situation of the patient inside that ambulance. Can you not think about ways and means by which we can address this problem? And not that I'm saying people don't have the civic sense to give way to them. Where is space to give way to them? True. And we're also seeing other uh, type of applications, like you know, some of the security applications at this point of time. And these are some of them which are the demand is driving us. On the supply side, technology is pushing. Yeah. And it's all therefore, what I keep summing it up is, it's human ingenuity of what are the applications that are likely to come by. And that is what will result in the growth of this. That's, that's, that's great, sir. Karthik, what's your take on this? I would just say that I think it's a unserved or underserved opportunity on mobility where there will be there and will continue to evolve and whether it is about air mobility or whether it is about road mobility, whether it is about uh, ferry shipping through sea route, I think all of them will continue to expand because it kind of reduces the time, it reduces a kind of uh, uh, ease of convenience, it does not really take if you want to move between two mountains or two islands and it is still a painful process today in terms of how do you really commute or how do you trek or how do you really go through a, a winch or a ropeway and different kind of things that are being used today. I think we'll have an opportunity to get streamlined and I remember talking to one of the executive from Airbus and almost in 2016 or 17. I said probably for aerospace and defense is a very stable industry and nothing gets disrupted and you are secured for the next 50 years. He said, come on, wait a minute. And it is not true. And he said, look at what is happening on Hyperloop. And if Hyperloops were successful, it will really demolish the regional aircraft industry per se. And uh, if two cities a uh, thousand kilometers apart are going to be connected in two hours and it really decimates the regional airport. And then he said SpaceX, which was just emerging the time, he said is already occupying the space and which has been supposed to be dominated by Airbus and Boeing and they are already disruptive and they are already talking about sending rockets, sending uh, people potentially to other planets and uh, they want to explore space completely. So, and the third thing he was talking about was drone, though it was used for military applications to probably freight logistics and I think the famous uh, commercial from Amazon was known to all of us. And now if you really look at it, uh, this is going to really make a mobility a lot more easier with something that is evolving. I think there is a lot of challenges that need to be still overcome, be it on safety, security, and the ability to really uh, make it uh, affordable because the cost of whatever I was uh, talking to uh, Fukuzawa was on how much would it be per kilometer or per mile cost because finally at the end of the day any commercial operations have to be feasible, have to be affordable and it should really make the mobility convenient as well as cheaper and for it to scale up. I think some of those issues still need to be addressed but one thing that I was very very confident is that by end of this decade we will see at least about quarter million to million of vehicles that will be moved in the air 
and it's going to be something that is an exciting opportunity for us as engineers in creating a new form of mobility and uh, partnering with someone like SkyDrive would really position us uniquely to take advantage of the opportunity that is lying ahead of us. Currently, there are more than 250 companies vying for this business and uh, one of the BCG reports said any segment, if there is a $50 billion of money that is going to be spent, is going to establish itself as a segment in 10, 20, 30 years. And in the last seven years, the kind of money that is flowing into urban air mobility is crossing the threshold of $50 billion with 250 companies trying to come and invest or doing some demonstra demonstrations or some pilots and they will probably eventually at least about a dozen companies will succeed but the money that is being spent today is already crossing $50 billion that is being put on this industry. So that's what is making it as an exciting potential opportunity with Scient being a leader in the transport segment. I think we are really geared up to support a new emerging segment in the form of air mobility. So I have another question for you, Karthik. When you talked about, you know, Dr. Reddy talked about technology being the driver, and you talked about the optimistic view of this becoming a segment by itself. If you have to pinpoint top three technologies that will change the game to be able to scale, in this domain you are referring. Yeah, yeah. See, if you look at on the air mobility, I think it is about navigation and uh, uh, autonomous uh, way of uh, transport. I think that is going to be very critical. I think every company which is getting into it, some are trying to have a pilot and mm -hmm. some of them are trying with autonomous. And uh, I think finally, eventually it will settle into one form of uh, uh, technology that will mature. I think both have an opportunity to stay here and in some applications may use pilot driven and some would be autonomous. I think that's definitely one of the key elements. The second would be about the battery technologies. I think this is going to be very, very important as uh, the kind of uh, uh, cycles that it has to go through. And I think it is supposed to be 10 times the power that is required for charging an automotive uh, vehicle that you need for urban air mobility. How do you think you can make it faster you can really find a way to dissipate the heat when you are flying and your ability to really uh, make it for uh, range. I think all would be decided by the battery capacity, battery technology that will really evolve. And the third important thing would be about integrating all of them to make it viable operations. I think you would really need to have, whether it is taxi operators or airlines or somebody who has to really make this whole uh, business to be viable. I think that is going to be very critical how the uh, capital would come into picture, whether the business case that need to establish itself and making it viable and how do you think that's going to come in. I think we were talking to Fukuzawa San earlier, will the railway operators jump in or airlines jump in or taxi operators jump in. I think it has huge potential for many people to come in, but somebody with a huge safety record will stand to gain and the safe operations is going to be the real difference that will make this a scalable uh, and really something which can go global. The more safer you make, the easier it would get adopted. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik. Fukuz um, I'm sure the audience is curious to know about the story of SkyTrack. Mm -hmm. What inspired you, how you got started, um, and where do you see the importance of ecosystem of partners playing a role here? My name is uh, Fukuzawa uh, Tomohiro and uh, founder and CEO of SkyDrive. Thank you very much for having a very special chance to yeah, work with our uh, client team. And um, I started uh, SkyDrive five, five years ago. And before that, um, I personally um, have an activity of making flying cars for, the, for about four years beforehand. So at first, when I was um, young, very, I, was, I liked mechanical things very much and I sometimes break down my refrigerator or yeah and many appliance approach and my mother get angry to me but and also yeah radio controller or like that and after that I and also I was on um, I like the TV show that uh, talked about innovation and things so and the one who makes the first um, Walkman a cassette recorder or a first uh, man who made a uh, uh, very big tunnel or a bridge. There, there is many difficulties in the story, but uh, eventually it enables everybody's uh, daily life 
uh, a little bit or much happier than before. And that kind of job is very, very interesting, I thought. And as uh, I entered uh, to Toyota Motor Company at first, after I graduated university, because Toyota Motor Company um, produced so much um, automobiles and that enables everybody's daily life a, a little bit better. Yes, and um, after that, um, my colleagues, when I was in university, started many IT startups. And IT uh, changed the world dramatically for the last decades. And I realized that, oh, mobility doesn't change so much. And also, um, to be able to uh, control or manage or make a new mobility in Toyota, I have to wait until 48, 45 years old. <laughs> Those kind of positions is very old. So I couldn't wait uh, 20 years. That's why we started the activity on Saturday or Sunday. So at first, um, 20 years old or 30 years old, um, 10 to 20 members get together to think what kind of mobility we're making. And there are, there are about 100 ideas. So um, two stories, um, car or um, digging car or a swimming car or many, many things. And in, in it, there was a flying car. And we talked so many days and finally decided to make a flying car because it is yeah, very, very fantastic and it's good for uh, ch our children too. And then we made at first a very um, hand light, small um, um, air um, flying car and it was very easy. But uh, when we tried to make a bigger one for a um, passenger, it was very difficult because if we make the um, drone twice, the stability is one force. So it was very, very difficult. And it took, it took four years be, uh, to make the flying stability. And when the flight became stable, um, I thought um, only uh, safety issue and business issue is a uh, key to go to market. And also, I thought it is difficult to do such a research and development only Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> and that's why I, I started uh, SkyDrive. Yeah, and when I talked with, about it with investors, uh, some investors said, oh, let's go. So that's why how I started five years ago. But uh, and soon after that, I realized that flying car looks car, but uh, actually aircraft, not the automobile. And I'm from automobile, so and I have no <laughs> specialty in it. So I try to find uh, a good um, members, team members from aviation sectors, battery sectors, and and um, EVTO sectors, and now we have about um, 300 members together um, to yeah, um, launch the vehicle in Very 2025. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And as we try to make, in EVTO sector, there are three very important issues. One is design, of course, and second one is manufacturing, and the third one is certification um, to be able to say we are safety enough, reliability enough to the um, same level with current aircraft. And manufacturing issue, we don't have special knowledge and uh, we want to focus more on design. That's why we collaborate with Suzuki because Suzuki is the biggest uh, compact car uh, company in the world. And of course, um, we wanted to make uh, this, we, we are focusing on the Asia market and Suzuki has a very big India share. So uh, we are now starting a business development with uh, Indian market with Suzuki. And yeah, that's why I, uh, we um, finally uh, start collaboration with uh, Cyan team um, with so many experience of aviation and other sectors. And yeah, we, we are very happy. We are very happy. Great, great. That's, that's a very- just, just to add to that, uh, Fukuzawa-san, Suzuki is known in India that it reaches the places that nobody else reach. And uh, even if you find your vehicle is broken down in a hilly region or a mountainous region or a desert, there is a service station within five kilometers to get it serviced. Mm. So that's a kind of access Suzuki has established in India. Okay. So when you're really talking about supporting something like an air mobility, they already have the service capabilities that are within uh, five square kilometers within wow. parts of all the entire India, which is a very vast country. Mm. And they're known for their serviceability and their ability to get it serviced across very, very many locations in India.
Thank you. So it means we can go everywhere in India via <laughs> Suzuki yeah, <laughs> service station. Ah, that's how far. Nice. And you're sitting in a room full of aerospace scientists. What was your, you talked about certification, you talked about manufacturing, you talked about that you came from an automotive background and you had to look for people who understand it all, who understand aerospace. To make it commercially viable, what were the challenges that you're facing right now? Thank you. So, there are, uh, I can't count how many challenges we have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, generally speaking, the biggest certification, uh, the biggest uh, challenge to launch the vehicle is uh, two, finance issue and certification issue. So actually, we have to uh, use several million dollars to develop a um, vehicle, and most of them we use it for um, reliability and um, safety. Um, so we do so much uh, design work, test work to get certification. So uh, as you know, the um, reliability uh, between drone and aircraft is more than 10,000 times difference, and we have to say, we have to um, say uh, it is clear that we have enough reliability by calculating, simulating, unit testing, and vehicle testing. Yeah. And we are now um, have a meeting with JCAB, a regulation in Japan and also an US regulator, uh, to talk about what test and what um, result we get with more than several hundred yeah, um, items. And it means uh, we get certification. And if we agree that um, strategy together, uh, now uh, we are uh, going to test. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a follow-on question. I've been always curious about it. You know, while we call it flying car, it seems to be more about a different kind of an aircraft. What is that one market that you think that if the EV toll becomes mainstream, what's that one market or industry it will disrupt completely? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think uh, we disrupt something completely, but uh, um, we we think we replace some uh, mobility it is not feasible enough. So we think uh, some mobility is not feasible enough when, when we have a traffic jam, for, for example, automobile. When we have a traffic jam, when there's no load, of course we cannot go, or uh, like that. And uh, um, so we, we want to replace some um, unreasonable um, mobility method. And of course, for example, our vehicle is focusing on a range less than 40 kilometers. So uh, less than 40 kilometers and the uh, efficiency of electric, electric is very good. And also, as we have a, a world's smallest, uh, lightest um, uh, EV tow, so it is easy to take, make a body port um, anywhere. But uh, more than that, it is difficult. And also, some case you should walk, some case you should have a motorbike or like that. So yeah, we, we think we have uh, another option. but. Uh, Eventually, I, I personally think um, we ha generally, we, when we go from A point to B point, we use some infrastructure, load or rail or like that. And with infrastructure, if infrastructure is not used, uh, we cannot use. But uh, to the air, yeah, we can use it whenever. So most efficiency and most could do, and of, as we are electric, zero emission, those are yeah, good, I think. If I like, if you permit me, I mean, I'd like to add, it might not disrupt um, any um, segment at this point of time, but I think it will make the whole systems extremely efficient. Uh, the examples I called out even earlier, for instance, uh, ambulances, for, they're stuck in traffic, um, and that is, there's no value for life. Therefore, you know, they become much more efficient, they are in a position to deliver the patients at the right place or if you look at security issues, or disaster management, all these, you may not, today are probably extremely inefficient. Uh, as a result, they're not growing either. But then once you have air mobility coming in, uh, urban air mobility, I think these uh, systems will become a lot more efficient. Mm. Right, right. Karthik, you have a point of view on this? No, I think I do see that some parts of uh, the helicopter business would probably die because it is still, to uh, Mr. Bivier's point, I think helicopters are still very inefficient and very difficult to operate. I think it is still expensive and... Uh, very small market penetration. Uh, right.
right. but even if you look at for example in uh, bangalore when they started from city to uh, airport which can take off from two three buildings and then uh, land and i think it is still very and plus the noise levels i think we spoke about especially when you want to operate in urban environment i think it is uh, super noisy and when you really have this with uh, electric uh, vertical takeoff would potentially disrupt commercial helicopter uh, charter operations mm -hmm. especially for short distances within urban or within uh, islands or within uh, uh, to mountains or hills when you are trying to connect and uh, it will be uh, zero emission it will be safe and it will also be faster if you really bring this up it may not happen immediately but it may be in 20 years time but it has an opportunity because what i realized is globally most of the helicopter commercial uh, companies are really finding it difficult to sustain it while the military operations are very uh, efficient for helicopter operations but commercially i think there are only three companies and uh, they are really struggling to operate and i think that would probably likely to get displaced at least 30 40 50 percent over the next two decades at least i think one interesting uh, discussion we were having some time back is when we talked about the price sensitivity of it or the financial viability of it i think in situations like saving life right giving the air ambulance kind of a service the price sensitivity will be anywhere low so i think there's that potential of making it much more viable in those use cases than to think about this as a Uber Air. I think we are still far away from that. Uh, no, you know, I think you know it has a potential to become the Uber Air for sure. But where I may have a slightly different thought is that today helicopters are not going to be Uber Airs anyway because several um, disadvantages Karthi called out right now. Uh, whether it's noise pollution that they create, the inefficiency that uh, they have in the system, uh, the takeoff and landing, all those uh, and the costs associated with it. But I think the um, urban air mobility does have a potential to become Uber Air. Uh, and it, it's a, a long way to go, but we never know how technologies will progress thereafter. So as a result of it could be in my generation itself that we'll see a number of these aerial vehicles flying all around. We'll talk about, yeah, swarms of them, mm -hmm. lighten up the birds, and that's my, the future I see. Like people are all flying around, getting to the offices, getting to the malls, and you know, the food is being delivered. All, all that will happen. I, I, I seriously feel that way, Karthik. So, you know, that brings me to a vantage point, sir, where, so where do you see the economics and the environmental impact of this kind of a development? Sure. The two things that you're calling out um, right now, one is uh, economics and the other is environment. Let's look at the economics part of it. I think for economics, I feel that there are two early days. It's too early to call how the economics will work out uh, because of several reasons. One is that the technology that's being deployed at this point of time is not mature. Uh, technology maturity certainly has given us uh, definitely economic benefits. Mm -hmm. So therefore, to estimate where exactly they would lie is uh, the challenge. Uh, Fukuzawa San said, you know, manufacturing, their good capabilities. But I still think that even here too, the verdict is not out. A very classic example is, uh, I can go public, I guess. Uh, we uh, made the GTF engine. Mm -hmm. uh, the turbine blades, for instance, were considered to be the most efficient that were made any time. But when they went to manufacturing thereafter, the yield was very poor. Uh, and that's a manufacturing challenge. So therefore, to improve the yield, they had to make some more changes to come by. Am I right, Raj? You're the expert. So therefore, I think unless we have manufacturing maturity also coming in, you can't call out the prices. So till such time, you know, when the yield was so low in manufacturing, the pricing was also very high. So therefore, the economics part of it. But we think the third one, which is extremely important, is the scale makes the difference. Mm. Uh, uh, I think, you know, still adoptability is low. Once the adoptability goes up, we'll see economies of scale coming by. So I would say it's too early to call. Uh, the biggest advantage today is the uh, ease with which we can operate certain segments which were extremely inefficient. And so therefore it will start with that. And once it starts picking up the momentum, you'll see more exotic applications. For all you know, the Zomoto drivers 
uh, will now have uh, air taxis going around. Hmm. It will not be any more the motorbikes. That may be a disruption of the future. Then let's go on to the second one on the uh, sustainability part or the eco part of it. Uh, certainly, I think we are seeing a lot more benefits coming out of the urban air mobility as opposed to the conventional or uh, the, the traditional ways of uh, doing flying. Start off with, um, again, um, the, uh, the fuel that's being used itself or the energy that's being used. On one side, you have battery. What's the alternative is you probably have to drive a car from point A to point B. Uh, what studies have proven is that if you probably spend the same amount of fuel at a central place, the energy efficiency is far superior compared to a distributed waste. You know, a million cars versus uh, a gigawatt power plant is far, far, gigawatt power plant has much higher efficiency. So therefore, the result is that power, which is actually driving our urban uh, air mobility, is going to be far more efficient. And today, uh, I think Karthik called it out a little earlier, that if you look at noise pollution, the environment part, uh, you don't need to see a helicopter in the air any longer. Uh, the whole house is vibrating at that point of time when a chopper is flying on your home, on top of your home. So therefore, I think air pollution will come down. That's the uh, second thing that will happen. Mm. And the third one that I also feel is that we will, we will see that you don't require a large number of roads and connectivity to go by. And, and all these roads are creating one other major challenge for us. They are doing deforestation and creating these forests into concrete jungles for us. Uh, that will go away, so the greenery will continue to remain there and we will definitely have better sustainability. I'll call these three things as big advantages for the urban air mobility. Great. That's, that's great to hear. Uh, Fukuz Awasan, on the um, environment sustainability part of it, right? Uh, when you started off, your mission is to create zero emission flying vehicles, right? Where do you see the future um, of urban air mobility playing towards sustainable impact? And the second is, where do you see the regulatory and infrastructure challenges? I think one thing that Dr. Reddy talked about, it doesn't need such a huge infrastructure like the road base that you have to you know, take off forest and all. But where do you see are the other challenges? You know, there is still safety a concern, right? There is still regulatory um, issues. Can you throw some light on that? Yeah, thank you. So, um, zero emission is very um, important issue for SkyDrive and also um, urban air mobility sectors as um, the uh, percentage of CO2 from um, aircraft is about 10% and it is very big uh, comparing with uh, people uh, using the aircraft and we want to minimize it and also so we, we want to solve two problems um, efficiency for to go from A point to B point and also efficiency for environment and if we do, I can solve two problems together. So um, from the beginning, uh, we are committing to zero emission uh, to start our business and to, to the market, market visible, the body port is very important to take off and landing. And for example, in Tokyo, there are about a hundred um, um, heliport at the top of the building and only two is can be used for helicopter because and the noisiness of helicopter and, and the government doesn't allow to use a heliport and if it is not emergency situation. But for an UAM, Ibito, we can use it. And uh, we, the, for the infrastructure, we only need two things. One is enough space and then the other one is um, battery charger. And we can use the same battery charger with EV, uh, electric vehicle and high speed charger. Uh, we can use and also the um, capacity of battery is almost same with automobile EV uh, even though the price level is 20 times or 30 times higher now but right. uh, on the background that is the opportunity for future and um, operation cost uh, decrease so um, infrastructure is uh, very reasonable we can think and but uh, of course uh, safetyness issue is very important and thinking of autonomy flying so going forward is very easy because no children or no gentleman comes in front of the air vehicle. But around the body board, we have to check it if the wind condition is good, if no people are there. So that kind of sensor we have to have. 
So those kind of sensors and charger, those are yeah, only the infrastructure we need. Yeah. And, and uh, given the nature of its sensitivity to wind and climate, etc., do you see certain kind of regions or countries are, are more viable options to implement this than others? Uh, so you mean which area yeah, is good yeah. to start? Yeah. Which countries? Which, which countries? countries are uh, I believe India. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. So, um, we have many business uh, development members and they are working in each country. And in India, the speed is massive <laughs> than others. Because maybe uh, we think um, for the last decades, um, several decades, so, m so many new technology are uh, adapted to India society. And uh, yeah, the growth is very, very huge. And, um, and also, there's many noise <laughs> around the city. So if it were noise, is almost nothing. So them. essentially he's saying there's enough noise around you and if it's noisy, it will make, it will yeah, not make yeah, a difference. Yeah. Ambient noise is good enough, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, but the uh, only, one, only one issue I, we think is that uh, people in India uh, have a conscience for money. So they never pay too much money, I heard. And uh, yeah, that is only yeah, uh, conscious I have, but otherwise, yeah, very, very okay, I agree. I think. Thank you, you said very right. <laughs> so, Karthik, that brings me to you, you know. Um, from a science perspective, where do you see our play in urban availability space, right? Given there's so much potential. Yeah, no, I think uh, whatever we have done over the last uh, 26, 27 years in aerospace and defense, I think our ability to support customers around safety critical design and all the way from hardware, software, mechanical and taking the products till certification and helping the customers on any of the design development support is going to be one area. Second, specifically around the electrical power distribution and there is definitely a significant opportunity to really bring uh, element of capabilities that we built over the last decade or so. And also to go through the complete uh, certification documentation, technical documentation, publication, <coughs> service bulletins, all this are needed. And also ability to support the maintenance, customer support. I think that is another area that we can definitely see a potential opportunity for us to support. I think it is essentially the capabilities around battery management and how do you think you can support the electrical power distribution. I think that's definitely the crux of where this would evolve mm -hmm. and uh, apart from your structural components and other things which may be I would say that is an easier part because the real development changes evolution that has to happen is around the battery as well as on the motor side and I remember talking to one of the CEO of Viscaro I think Viscaro mm -hmm. is another uh, company which is trying to do that what he said was interesting he said since this is a complete development started in house and they were doing battery, they were doing motor, they were doing the complete uh, subsystem in ours. And what he was saying that is if we start bringing a tier one, tier two ecosystem, they can reduce the cost by 50% mm. because they were doing everything in ours, they were including the test facility and he said we have really built almost uh, half a billion dollar investment that they made because they were doing everything from scratch. Mm. And if we really look at it, when we talk about the energy density on the current batteries, I think it has to really be l less weight as well as it should have more energy efficiency per cell. Mm. And it is better developed by a battery manufacturer mm. who is in that business. And the second aspect was on the cost of operations, which is going to be through the electrification that is happening on the automotive side will help in setting up the infrastructure across many cities and uh, many countries and uh, this coming in subsequent to the electrification of mobility would probably augur well for the infrastructure side of it. Mm. And I think the estimations are there is at least about the current uh, global power capacity if this is about 3500 gigawatt you need additional 6000 gigawatt in the next 20 years and the way that this would get built would be more renewable and that is going to really help in setting up the infrastructure which is clean and uh, anything that is going to leverage the infrastructure of uh, clean energy would be more adopted, more applied whether it is in urban environment or any mobility uh, 
related transport environment i think would be preferred modes of transport so this will also have the adoption which is going to be much more faster in the next 10 15 years as the infrastructure gets built for road transport but which will also augur well for uh, any air mobility related transport thank you thank you karthik tom i have a question um, since you mentioned we are very cost conscious population in india what do you think is your target price per passenger mile for sky drive if you launch commercial in india no oh, nice question <laughs> <laughs> so so the two cost big co price and the ticket price to ride for other service so big as a as first big cost is almost same level with um McLaren or um, Ferrari or like that. So yeah, it is difficult to uh, buy for ordinary people like me. But uh, for other service, yeah, we can. Yeah, 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 much, much better. So <laughs> <laughs> we are trying to start a service and um, around uh, at first uh, in uh, emergency issues and also um, sightseeing place. So there are some uh, such very big statue or very big nature, and we, we never see um, from above. And the helicopter cost is too high and uh, noisy. So we hope at first, uh, it, from the beginning, the cost price is uh, almost same or a little bit less than helicopter. It's our target, and we are trying to do it. Yeah, and of course, just less noise, good for environment. So we hope we have we can get give a good value. So uh, Tom has still not given us the exact price, but I think we can all be ready for the helicopter ride. Imagine. Um, so, as an Indian, should I also call out uh, what my expectation is, uh, Tom? <laughs> yes. So Tom, yeah. you're getting the consumer survey right here, right? So now. therefore, let's look at uh, what uh, an automobile does for us these days. Hmm. If I go and rent an automobile, approximately, I think he charges me about 15 rupees for every kilometer he drives around for me. Mm -hmm. 15 rupees is uh, more like um, uh, two, se two cents. Two cents. Two 20, cents. No, 20, 20, 20 cents. 20 cents for every kilometer you drive. So, 60 cents. No, 50, 80 rupees. I'm saying 15. 15 rupees. 15 ka. 15 rupees of. No, yeah, yeah. 15 rupees of watch. <laughs> Unless you're paying 50 rupees for us. <laughs> no. 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 Uber roughly charges, I thought, 15. No, 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 I thought like I <laughs> So, approximately, say, uh, 20 cents is what, what uh, it costs us at this point of time. Okay. But the 20 cents also, on average, takes two passengers. So, I have to half it at least. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, I, so, that gets to 10 cents. I'm willing to give you 10 times that cost. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So a dollar is what I uh, I did by math before I came here, roughly. <laughs> I think you, you want to share what is that you are trying to target in the next 10 years by 2030 or 31? 10 times? Yeah. Yeah. You said the current cost could be what uh, yeah. you were saying that is it is $20 per kilometer. kilometer. No, I'm talking about Indian, yeah, right? But, but when you start the operation <laughs> around 26, 27. Oh. But he said in five to six years time, you were saying that unless it is brought to two dollars per kilometer, it is going to be difficult to scale and make it viable for commercial operation. Yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah, this current cost is including vehicle cost, and you are saying about fuel cost. No, Same. no, no. Uh, uh, th th that's the cost if I uh, rented a car. Is what uh, rent a car. Oh, rent oh, rent rented a car. Uber, okay. Okay. Uber rent. Uber rent. Uh, Uber rent. Uh, Uber. Uh, okay, okay. So it includes uh, the amortization of the vehicle. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So everything put together, I'm a dollar. You're two dollars uh, in a stable environment. Okay. We'll we'll merge together. <laughs> <laughs> no, but especially for Indian operations. Keeping that as a benchmark may not be a bad idea yeah, 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 to yeah, really look at yeah. uh, a volume based operations yes. that can really give the scale yeah. if you can really be brought around and the dollar. The speed, time, speed is five times faster. Agree? Yeah. No, I don't dispute. <laughs> but I gave you ten. No, 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 no. Tom, I gave you ten times. Okay, so, ten uh, times. Ten okay. times okay. I gave you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, but you can always charge that premium that you're talking about, Tom. In the scenario like the air ambulance, right, where timing is, yes, where the, the duration is premium, yeah, 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 right, or in luxury travel, mm. right. Okay, mm. great. Yeah. So you know, that brings me to um, to one interesting question for all of you, and in, in, in any order, 
Um, what's that one message that you would want to give to someone who's really looking at riding in a flying car or an air taxi or an air ambulance in the next five years as a consumer? So I, I think, I personally think um, people in the world all um, use load too much. So we are already touching uh, ground, but uh, there's so huge sky. So we should use sky more. So ne, not only touching the ground. Yeah, go, going sky is more freedom and more efficient. Yeah, and now that we are making zero emission vehicle, yeah, now it, it is a time to ne, release human being from the ground, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good one. That's very philosophical. Yeah, yeah. So at first, every in in a daily life, everyday use is a little bit difficult, maybe. But at first, I, I think it is good to try out, have a trial, yeah, to go to sky with reasonable cost at first, and little by little, uh, as we um, make it infrastructure of our daily life, yeah, you, you use in daily life. That might be a good idea and. Have a try is my message. <laughs> so therefore, I'll, I'll add to what Tom said. Uh, going to the sky is more um, to do with excitement. So it's very exciting for people to move away from ground, get into the sky, fly around, etc. But I would add to that saying that, you know, in addition to getting to the, uh, to the sky, but look at the convenience that it provides to you. Enormous amount of convenience it will do. I mean, uh, instead of... Uh, in, in the city of Hyderabad, in the south pa southwest part of the town that we are sitting at this point of time, where uh, many people, uh, this part of the town accommodates about uh, a million people. There are about nine million people outside this part of the town. Okay. They also are very jealous of uh, us saying that you've got the best of infrastructure. But trust me, from five to seven in the evening, most of our roads become parking lots, oh. nothing moves, even here. Yeah. So, and therefore, people are just wasting their time mm. for two hours. Mm. Uh, so the result is, therefore, my point, uh, Minu, is in addition to the excitement of sky, look at the convenience it provides. Yeah, and also thinking of safetyness, uh, the ratio of getting accident is much less in the sky than on the road. So, yeah, good but environment. Tom, that way you don't know India, right? We might actually create a traffic jam in the air. Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, and there are ne, huge air. So <laughs> one thousand times, ten thousand times more space in the air. Yeah. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. You know, and uh, somebody actually asked and made a comment that does that mean we will need a new kind of talent? You know, the the air taxi pilots. Yes. Are your so are your Uber drivers going to convert into that, or are your pilots going to become the air taxi pilots? So, for thinking of 10, 20 years later, uh, only first five years a pilot is needed for EV tow or air taxi, and and after that, um, start from remote pilot and autonomy is coming soon for the uh, next 10 years or 20 years. So yeah, we don't have to care so much in the long run. And in the short term, um, we are um, uh, as a new helicopter in a role. So we get the certification as a new helicopter. So a um, pilot who has a helicopter license uh, can easily convert to EVTO um, pilot. And of course, we have to have more pilot uh, around the world too for the moment. Kartik, do we see you as? as one of the pilots in the next 10 years. Well, I'm not sure about the pilot, but it would be at least an adventurous experience to start with, whether it is parasailing or bungee jumping, and <laughs> probably it will start from uh, somewhere for people to get an adventurous experience. But it will start getting used to uh, like what many of us have seen. I think 10 years ago, I was in a car, and one of the customers was driving me on an Audi A4, and he kind of put it on autonomous. And he said, let's kind of really uh, experience the autonomous uh, uh, features of the car. And on one of the signal, he was just, just before hitting the traffic signal, he kept telling the car saying, that, hope it breaks, hope it breaks, hope it breaks. <laughs> and I was scared for a few seconds and it actually applied the brake three seconds after he said. And uh, he was saying that I was also not sure whether it'll actually apply the brake or not. 
so from that anxious moments i think it will probably uh, now all of us do believe that autonomous or safe driving is reality and uh, it really helps us to be a lot more safer today i think on the road we are at least about uh, five times more safer than 15 years ago with the kind of safety features that gotten into cars so i'm sure the same thing will happen on the air mobility as well there could be initial anxious moments there could be adventurous opportunities and people who really thrive on adventurous experiences may take off and probably they will be the early adopters and they will probably pull the rest of the people to really start following that and right. also i think the safe operations is going to be extremely critical and uh, because every small issue will get uh, uh, exposed out of proportion because everybody would be very anxious to see that how this is likely to fail i think human brains are wired for negative thoughts and negative emotions uh, at least 20 times more than the positive experiences so there will always be some anxious time for few years before it becomes a regular operations but i think with the amount of uh, uh, engineering power that is getting into and the amount of uh, technology that is going to really help us in the next 10 years i think i do see that this would be a safe mobile operations maybe a decade from now and which all of us would really not talk about this as adventurous but this is way of life Great. Thank you. So Thank just you. to add uh, to what uh, Karthik said on safety, in relation to safety, and he's saying you know technology will play a very important role. Uh, technology will make these devices very safe. I'll add to that you know technology will also bring UI UX to a level that you don't require the pilot anymore. Uh, this so I'm back to my Zomoto driver. <laughs> He is the new pilot for my urban air mobility. Uh-huh. Uh, because I, you don't require them. You, they become so sophisticated at this point of time. We we'll look at the cars, the single panel on which you can do everything. So, the, in addition to the technology making safety, which I completely agree with uh, uh, Karthik, but in addition to that, you bring this UI UX technology also into play. I think it will become much easier. Uh, the skill level will be far lower than what we require as a pilot to maneuver these uh, devices. So, so then, uh, Dr. Reddy, you think uh, technology like Gen AI will definitely help it make more intuitive and absolutely. But I, I, I was very surprised. But after, though, if people uh, day before yesterday there was a industry meet uh, with the minister and some people, uh, a gentleman who made this comment saying that can you start using Gen AI to uh, uh, look at the traffic congestions that we have at this point of time? Many mm. people laughed at it. but after thought to me was no that was a good suggestion actually so therefore we may have, there's so much amount of data that will be available to us and so many decisions can be taken online i think gen ai may be one way of solving this problem too fantastic i think on that fantastic note uh, there are four key things that's coming out very clearly from the panelists here is it's definitely going to be an exciting journey it can bring convenience it will be sustainable it can be made safer and it can be far more intuitive and immersive journey right if you use gen ai and uh, i'm sure the audience is curious to ask question to panelist uh, this has been an exciting discussion i'll open the the room for q and a now okay we have the first question from raj i have uh, two questions for you first thing is on the air traffic controller today it is a central command correct first thing is how you and this is the air traffic controller will be, will be self managed or it is going to be central command that's my first question second question is i believe uh, urban air mobility would be a low entry barrier for the new comers to come in because uh, funding wise today if i want to develop a new commercial aircraft it's costing me 10 billion 20 billion like that so whereas a uam possibly may be around half a billion that's first thing second thing is the technology entry barriers in a commercial aircraft or engine systems lot of things are there whereas here we are going to be using lot of things that's possibly available to us today in terms of battery technology in terms of motors and all those things okay so how do you intend to scale grow and protect considering the entry barrier will be minimal so that took us sense okay so at the first one so um, we are uh, called a new uh, helicopter uh, in a row 
So in that case, a um, helicopter is con not controlled so much from a uh, center, but the pilot itself is um, controlling. But of course, before the start of flying, uh, they announced to the um, government that we will start flying from A point to B point in this time or like this route or like that. So same thing is happening in Ibito. But uh, um, in 10 years of starting of Ibito, there are so many uh, vehicles and um, also in NASA or other facility, uh, they are making a um, not, you know, virtual load uh, in the sky and for transportation from a um, very frequently used area, uh, those kind of virtual load is used. And in that case, um, manual handling is very difficult. So uh, centralized uh, control is now sought. And that kind of discussion is now proceeding in e sectors, yes. And second one is uh, the barrier to enter the market. Is, I think it is um, very, very big because there are about 200 or 300 projects or companies of EV tolls, and only 10 or a little bit more than that has already get $100 million or more. And um, to finish the vehicle, um, several million dollars or more is needed. So uh, the hurdle is big. And uh, why, why I could enter was that because I was an automobile guy and I didn't know how difficult it is to make aviation. So um, every year when I do a <coughs> skydrive job and I, I realize that the amount of money I have to use is twice than one year ago or like that. And eventually now he almost finish uh, calculation and uh, idea is huge. So if we knew, know um, the, the amount of money is needed at the beginning, we are, I couldn't start, I think. And uh, yeah, I, I talked with some other founder of Ibito company, and half of them are like that. So not the very, very center of aviation guy, but the outsider is, uh, ne, doesn't know so much and just have energy to uh, try to go something in <laughs> like that, I think. So this is an evolving space, right? Even for the people, founders, as well as the regular. So what kind of challenge are facing for Okay, thank you. So um, four years ago, it was the challenge was very, very high because EBTO wasn't decided to um, what kind of certification is needed. But for the last few years, uh, the certification rule is set. So some EVTO are fixed wing type, some EVTO are rotor craft helicopter type. And now we are talking the uh, strategy yeah, of uh, finding a uh, test clarification. And new thing of EVTO is almost two. One is we are using electricity and aviation never use electric or battery for the main um, engine or fuel. So this is a new one. And also the other one is there are um, many um, rotors or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, rotors ahead. And for example, in, when, when it is bad strike happens um, and one rotor hit and it sometimes go to another rotor. And in that case, rotor down, rotor down, rotor down. And it is very critical situation for vehicle. So we have to care about what happens if one rotor fails. It shouldn't go to the other uh, rotors. So these kind of things are very new. And yeah, we are continuing discussing in, uh, with regulator and also uh, same with o OEM issue. So uh, we always say that the weather plays a spoil sport, right, in, many of, in the operations as such. And when we are flying at an altitude of 2,000 to 5,000 uh, and also like tunnel effect and the uh, skyscrapers being there or wind, snow, uh, rain, um, how do you see the risks of the weather and how it could be managed? Okay, so um, wind is almost all what we have to care 
so uh, more than 10 or 15 uh, meters per second. And not only the speed, but also how, and, like, yeah, 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 and how, like, ne, turbulence. turbulence, yeah, or, yeah, like that is very important. So we have to check one by one uh, by uh, seeing or, uh, yeah. And, but uh, it's the same with helicopter too. So especially for public air helicopter, they have to watch um, weather very much. And, and if there is too heavy rain, too heavy rain brings too heavy wind uh, and, uh, yeah, and together. So wind is the most difficult one, I think. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. So when you spoke about losing a lot of air and space and other things, the kind of energy it still required it requires a special improvement. And is it that emission is limited to pond here to be selected? Because you can't really get up a charge battery whenever you want. And do, we have a range for half an hour or one hour. So will it be kind of limited for the this point initially for five years? Or how you really want to use the entire space you want to use it? No, this is going to ride on the infrastructure set up by the automotive industry. Yeah. That's what I was yeah. saying. So this is coming probably five years, seven years down the line. By the time the infrastructure for energy battery storage, yeah. battery uh, charging for automotive would have established in many countries. Yeah. I, I think the electrification is happening across many geographies globally. So since this is going to come on top of that, this is going to really use a lot of infrastructure that is going to be set up by the automotive and the energy industries. To, to addition to that, um, the, one of the um, important KPI in the EBITO sector is TAT, it is turn around time. So yeah, how many minutes we have to wait until the next flight will start. So this including charging time or passenger yeah, time or like that. And cool yes, cooling that. Yeah. And cool down time is the most difficult one, uh, actually. So uh, the trend is uh, higher voltage of battery is in EV sectors. Yeah. How uh, do you see Maybe eventually space tourism, uh, do you think someday we'll have a booking, take me to the space and come back through UAMs in maybe in how many years if that may so happen? Yeah, yeah, we want to make a good um, propulsion system. So making an innovative propulsion system is the biggest yeah, um, things we have to make. And of course, and not only going to yeah, space, but also we want to make the vehicle as small as possible so that we can use in our daily life. So for example, from yard or from yeah, uh, very small space, we want to go. So innovative propulsion system is yeah, very looking for, for all of our engineers of SkyDrive. Well, we can uh, already feel that all of us are going back to our Star Wars fantastical ideas about flying cars. But one thing is coming out very clearly that intelligent engineering and technology solutions mm. will definitely brighten the future of urban air mobility. And uh, I want to thank all the panelists for your candid insight, perspective, dreams. And Dr. Reddy, I'm really looking forward to the, the urban air mobility aircrafts and Uber Airs and Air Zomato <laughs> coming to reality <laughs> soon in Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. Right? Right, team? Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank really you. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.